Okay, so today we're going to start our third discussion on intercultural communication. We want to begin examining the concept of deep structures and the role they play in the development and the perpetuation of culture. The first deep structure we want to discuss is that of families. And this will center our entire discussion for the most part today. We want to consider the cultural variants within families that include gender roles, group orientation, aging, and social skills, and how the concept of family is thus influenced by those factors and how the concept of family influences those factors in particular. So, as we begin, in the study of intercultural communication, it's not enough simply to know that some people bow while others shake hands, or that some exchange gifts as an important part of a business transaction, uh, while others perceive such an act of exchanging gifts as a business transaction as out outright bribery. Although these specific behaviors are indeed significant for us to know, it is more important to know what motivates people to engage in one action rather than another action. The key to this understanding is deep structures within cultures. The key ideas we're going to cover today are that social institutions are where those deep structures reside. There are three social institutions that in our series of discussions that we're going to pay the closest attention to, uh, the family being the first. And we're going to talk about the family's influence on culture and the cultural variance in family interaction. So what is a deep structure? When we talk about culture's deep structure, we're talking about both conscious and unconscious assumptions about how the world operates. It is what unifies a culture, makes each culture unique, and interesting enough, it explains the how and the why of culture's collective actions. We're going to cover the culture's view of the world, including ethics, ideas about God and religion, nature, aesthetics, approaches to health and medicine, perspectives on death, and other questions dealing with the ultimate question. That ultimate question, of course, being the meaning of life. Remember that I just stated that family is the first of the three social organizations or social institutions that carry the deep structure concept throughout culture. The other two that we're eventually going to cover in future discussions are going to be the state or the government and religion. There are four, we four reasons why the family, the community, or the state, the government, and religion are so vitally characteristic to culture and why we need an understanding of them in order to fully appreciate and develop any competence in intercultural communication. You may recall the discussion about Huntington's proposal which holds much evidentiary truth and places everything here in perspective. The people of different civilizations have different views. The people of different civilizations have different views on the relations between God and man, the individual and the group, the citizen and the state, parents and children, husband and wife, as well as differing views on the relative importance of rights and responsibilities, liberty and authority, equality and hierarchy. We have conflicts with other cultures often due to the clashes of cultural values. Believe it or not, it's cultural values and not political issues that cause us to have the greatest conflicts in this world. Deeply seated ideas of persecution, morality, retribution, etc. 
All of these penetrate to the heart of culture. All are felt deeply by members of the culture, and thusly all are actionable as a consequence. Retribution and war and things of this nature are actionable when violated. So what are those four reasons why family, community, and religion are so vitally characteristic? The first is that they carry culture's most important messages. Think about that. We learn probably our first instances and ideas of what is right and what is wrong from our families. That's further enforced by the state, further enforced by whatever religion we may or may not subscribe to. The fate of power or free choice, which controls our fate. Loyalties, affiliations, where should you reside? Preparing for death. How do you prepare for death? So the first major reason, they carry culture's most important messages. The second, they carry enduring messages. What messages do we get from art? Stories that are handed down, fables, etc. These are things that are enduring in the culture. They carry messages that are deeply felt. The third reason. We're offended, for example, when we perceive others insult our, our values. You know, it's one thing for us to make fun of our own values amongst each other. It's amazing how quickly we become highly offended when someone who isn't from our culture makes fun of or pokes fun at certain things that we value highly within our own culture. So they're deeply felt. And then finally, the fourth, they carry messages that deal with personal identity. A person isn't born with an identity. They're not born. We're, we aren't born with an identity. And thus we absorb that identity from culture because we have exposure to these institutions. Our family actually gives us our first idea of identity. Views are identified in process, and we go from the I to we, and we begin to identify more with groups, such as our ancestry, our religion, language, history, values, customs, and other institutions within that culture. We have a variety, thus, of identities. And for example, depending upon the culture, when we talk, we're going to make a word of individualism and collectivism later. But if we come from a highly individualized society, a highly individualistic culture, we have a tendency to develop identities that are very strongly related to the I and the individual. If we come from a collectivist culture, we have a tendency to relate to identities that are more centered on the we. And yet, there's a balance of both of those all the way through, no matter where we are. Because, for example, we who are born in the United States and or are American citizens strongly relate to the we when we talk about U.S. citizenship. But part of what it means to be a U.S. citizen means we're, we're highly individualistic, doesn't it? So there's a balance on that continuum. A person's cultural identity th thus exerts profound influence on his or her patterns of behaviors, norms, patterns of thinking, and how we communicate with one another. Of those deep structures of culture, we talked about the three, obviously we're going to spend the day talking about family. Family is at the heart of culture's survival. The family is the chief socializing, socializing agent of the biological organism that comes out of the womb and must learn how to spend the entirety of his or her life around other human beings. What a task. What an incredible task. The family is therefore the oldest and most fundamental of all human institutions. 
and as a consequence, it is probably in some form or another the most basic and universal unit of collective society throughout every culture that has or will be. So how do we define family? Now, for the sake of our discussion, we're going to take the 2009 uh, LaManna and Reedman de uh, definition. A family is any sexually expressive or parent-child or other kin relationship in which people, usually related by ancestry, marriage or adoption, and have three functions. Number one, form an economic unit and care for any young. Number two, Consider their identity to be significantly attached to the group. And number three, commit to maintaining that group over time. Caring for the young, identify with a group, and maintain that group for the future. And of course, we live in a society composed of many kinds of families. In the United States, we can easily find married couples, step families, single parent families, multi-generational families, cohabitating adults, child-free families, families headed by gay men or by lesbians, and the combinations perhaps go on. Whether or not you agree with them, they do indeed exist. Definition, therefore, at best, as you can already tell, based on the definition we've discussed, becomes difficult. But at least the Lamana and Reedman provide us with a working definition that is useful for our purposes. When we talk about families, we probably look at it in terms of two categories initially. Most people see overall families throughout their lives as participants. Those two families are the family they are born into, the family of their orientation and the family that is formed when they take a mate. And as we just discussed, that can be composed of a variety of possibilities. We also look at families in terms of a nuclear family, meaning two generations, parent, parent and child. This is common in developed nations. The elderly happen to reside often in developed nations, in retirement communities, nursing homes, and to take an aged parent regarding, uh, is often regarded as an economic burden in these societies. It's oftentimes a threat to household privacy, and in highly individualistic countries and cultures, a threat to independence. In a nuclear family, exploration and creativity are often encouraged. The child is often given the opportunity to explore those creative urges that they may, may or may not have and explore various interests. That may not be possible when you're trying to regulate larger groups or extended families under the same roof. So in a nuclear family, Everyday needs are met, such as economic support, child care, and social interaction, more intense with that nuclear family than with the extended family. And the extended family, of course, as I'm already alluding to, is the second form of family that we might look at, which includes grandparents and relatives. This is common in developing and underdeveloped nations that the extended family happen to live together. So that along with married parents and their offspring, there might be parents, parents, grandparents, siblings of the spouses and children, and in-laws. And they all might live either in one house or in one group of homes close to one another, forming one cooperative unit. In extended family units where they live, there are usually more rules because and creativity can't be followed as much because you've got more people that we have to regulate and perhaps we've got to regulate economic resources a little bit more strictly. However, 
we get to share the workload of raising the children, don't we? And that sometimes alone can be well worth it as far as giving some adults a little bit more free time. Various conditions in the United States seriously affected the makeup of families in recent history, hasn't it? Let's just look at the economics of what's happened over the last 20 years. In the United States, the economy has not been the strongest it could have been or has, has been in even previous history. As a result, how the family is put together and what kind of changes can certainly affect how the family is able to live. And in the last 20 years, you might figure the fact that marriage rates began to fall. Divorce rates began to rise. Economic changes forced families to consider how they were structured and lived. Technological changes and innovations, in innovations with communication. For example, travel. It's easier to travel, although expensive. But it allowed families to move where there might be better jobs. Or to keep long-distance relationships alive as a possibility. Or even because of the travel, intercultural marriages became more convenient. The U.S. Census reports that the number of children under the age of 18 living with both parents declined between 2000 and 2010. With the divorce rates rising, younger children living with both parents didn't happen as much. But with the economics dropping, for those parents that did stay together, there was an awful lot of children who stayed and continue to stay in the home for much longer durations. Foreign-born members of the U.S. population, foreign-born members, so we're talking about immigrants, now account for more than 12% of the overall population in the United States. Thus, if you think about it, their self-concept having been formed within other cultures and their perspectives are now integrating in the U.S. culture and they don't necessarily adopt immediately. In fact, they contribute to some of the variety of what it means to be part of a family in the United States. Are we already starting to see the importance of understanding various cultures just to get along in our own culture? The vitality of such, I think, is just incredible. We wind up with new family types, as we talked about before. Children living with one parent. A heterosexual woman and man who have cohabitated and have children but never get married. Two gay men or two lesbians who have adopted children. A single woman or man who has adopted a child. 20, 30 years ago, never heard of. Today, relatively common. Why? Globalization. And we've talked about globalization previously. But when you look, for example, at mass media, computers, cell phones, the TV, now link people who have never seen one another, creating global networks or virtual communities that reach beyond the political nation state borders. You know, it's interesting, for example, if it might be as something as simple as playing a video game. For those of you that are into these role playing games where you're putting on a headset and you're live in this virtual world, and you've got a microphone attached to that headset, and next thing you know, you're talking and interacting with people from the other side of the planet, from a completely different culture. The mere fact that you're able to interact really gets at the heart of how mass media has affected globalization. The interesting thing is that these communication channels are dominated by Western communities and Western cultures and thusly contain many Western cultural messages that non-Western cultures have to struggle with integrating. I give you the example of Hollywood movies. 
that express cultural values such as nudity, materialism, competitiveness, assertiveness, fitness to the point of anorexia, and even mocking the elderly. There are some cultures around the world who might find all of that offensive because it doesn't go with what they have been deeply rooted and their deep structures have tried to teach their individuals within their cultures and instill completely opposite values. Such as, instead of the nudity concept, modesty. Rather than materialism, spiritualism. Rather than competitive, competitiveness, harmony. Rather than assertiveness, cooperation. Rather than anorexic thinness, health. And instead of mocking, how about a deep respect for the elderly? That's difficult because Western influences through mass media, Hollywood controls an awful lot of the mass media and Hollywood distribution all over the world, even in countries where they have historically tried to block mass media influences. It's impossible to block because of pirated movies and pirated websites, et cetera, et cetera, that people are able to get to, and they get exposed to this anyway. And so, for example, when I was teaching in Saudi Arabia, where much of the websites were blocked and much of the internet was blocked as a result of all the channels coming through uh, King Saud University, for example, and they would make the, the decisions about which websites would not be blocked so that, you know, which ones were, were free for people to, to view coming from the West. It was possible for others to gain satellite access to the internet that wasn't controlled by Saudi Arabia and start seeing an awful lot of things that the Saudi ministry of various other governments would have preferred they not see because it went just totally against the values they were trying to instill in their deep structure and their culture. Migration, another factor in globalization. The number of people living outside their country of birth is greater than ever before, and the numbers keep rising. For example, if you look at people from the Philippines, Mexico, Africa, Latin America, these are countries where the economies are having issues and trouble, worse than what might be experienced in other countries. And so oftentimes they come to Canada, the United States, or Western Europe with hopes of finding better employment, better jobs, better sources of income, that they might then send that money back to their families of their home country. So what are the functions of the family? The first being reproduction. Reproduction allows a culture to perpetuate itself, doesn't it? Without the infusion of new life, the culture would soon disappear. The second, economic function, providing for practical needs. You know, if we go back to the idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where does a baby, a human baby, get all of the basic needs covered? Well, of course, the family is the initial support for things like food and shelter and clothing. Socialization. Families are responsible for teaching important traditions and social skills as well as values and morals. You know, children are not born into the world that automatically disposes them to believe in one God, in many gods, or in no gods. They're not automatically inclined to be devoted to a higher power of a sort. Whether that be Allah, Christ, Buddha, Confucius, or the forces of nature. But the family teaches them that. 
So that teaching process of all these higher values begins at home. How important is communication now? Of all the multi-dimensions of our identity, and we have a variety of multi-dimensional identity issues, right? Individual identities, national identities, cultural identities, sexual identities, ethnic identities, social class identities, family identities. Of all of these plus others, the family is the most important because it is the precursor to all others. You cannot actually identify with any of the others unless the family first and teaches you how to accept those others. What does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? That's taught in the family, the family identity first. We are often recognized by our family name long before our individual name. In fact, some cultures, through their customs, find that so prioritized that some cultures identify you not by your first name, your given name first, your family name second, but the reverse. Your family name is actually stated first in practice and your given name second. A lot of Asian cultures do that. So, functions of the family, reproduction, economic, socialization, identity. The family is both the product of communication and the context in which communication takes place. Both the product and the context. The family itself is a social construction. Somehow, we as human individuals have gathered together to say this particular group of individuals are important and are a unit. Do they have to be? Not necessarily. So it's a social construction that somehow we have gathered together and decided this is important. And so it's a product of communication because social construction happens through communication. It's also the context in which communication takes place. The family teaches many communication skills as well. It introduces people to language. Whatever language that might be part of that particular culture, it introduces the, the child to language. And it also tells people how to employ and use that language. It tells people how to create, maintain, and even end relationships. How to express ourselves, how to argue, how to display affection, how to choose acceptable topics for mixed company, what topics are even approachable in single gender company. And these are just to name a few. How to employ language. What else do we learn within our family? What else is communicated to us? How about what it means to be a member of a gender? Again, another social construction. What does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? Well, in various cultures, it can mean different things. How do I know this? Do we give, are we given some inherent right to some, some characteristics because I'm male or because I'm female? No, believe it or not, that's actually created in the culture and the society. Most sociologists believe, anyway, that the, people, the way people are socialized has a greater effect on their gender identities than do biological factors. That's important to note. Different societies allocate different tasks and duties to men and women, and that males and females have culturally defined views of themselves and one another. So if you think about the United States, for instance, Males are socialized to be successful, aggressive, sexual, and self-reliant. Whereas, females are often socialized to be nurturing, sensitive, 
interdependent, and appearance conscious. Now, over the last 20 years, has some of that changed? Yeah. A lot of them have, a lot of females have been able to take on roles that are expectations well far beyond the housewife. They've taken on the idea of soldier, SWAT and police, doctor, professor, and the list goes on and on. Now, what has caused them in a particular society not to get paid the same or equal wages? Again, social construction and how we view gender in society. In Asia, for instance, boys study the classics. They are often indulged and wild and unregulated, whereas girls confined often to the inner quarters of the house and are taught things like modesty reticence, not to be assertive, compliance. Confucianism made men relevant members of society and certainly task functional. I am, and then I can define myself by the task I do in life. And don't we do sometimes the same thing? when we identify ourselves in the American culture by our job? That's not all, that's not uniform everywhere. Women were often regulated to social dependence. They were social and cultural functional, not necessarily task functional. In Latino societies, for instance, the male was the undisputed authority, so the father ran the household of the family. And if the father didn't exist or was gone, the eldest son made most of those decisions. And in the Latu Latino cultures, motherhood was seen as sacred. However, women were primarily and are primarily homemakers. The economy changes some of these ideas, of course, some of these traditionally held ideas, of course. In Indian society, Hinduism positions masculinity and femininity as oppositional, as alternate sides of a coin. The males are superior. Females must be devoted to the husband's welfare. Doesn't that sound exciting? Now, some of you who are females in the American culture listening to this are, are sitting there going, yeah, right. And yet, these are the values that are instituted from culture to culture to culture. In the Arab world, often in the Middle East, the Muslim religion dominates. And Islam characterizes males as physically, mentally, and morally stronger than females. The Quran specifically addresses men only. So it directs women to obey husbands. Men are valued. And women viewed through the prism of family, honor, chastity. Women are protected by others in the family and thus valued, often valued, and if you talk to them, they'll tell you this, valued as treasures to be protected. And that's why they're often cloistered with the family and held away from public viewing. And their honor is forever protected by the males in that family. We talked about the fact that westernization and globalization is changing even gender roles, even the ones we just discussed, culture to culture. Women are increasingly incorporated into the world economy. They need to be. A lot of mothers are leaving their families to go move to other countries to get jobs, for instance, so they can send money back if the fathers are incapable of doing so. A lot of fathers are taking, a lot, taking the home role specifically and are dealing, with having to, uh, are dealing with having to raise the family if the mother goes off to be the bread earner, to be the wage earner. 
A lot of non-Western cultures are feeling like they must guard against applying Western standards to everyone else. And those of us that often grow up in the American culture have a tendency to look through the American cultural viewfinder and measure all other cultures based on how we think it ought to be. And sometimes that's where we err. But changes are indeed coming. Let me give you an example. In 2009, I attended a college university graduation in the northwest quadrant of Saudi Arabia at a university. At that time, I was responsible and overseeing approximately 40 different university instructors in English and communication. Male and female, and this was an interesting move forward. Females were allowed to get an education. That wasn't always the case, a college education. Although I had a split faculty. The men taught at the men's campus, the women taught at the women's campus, and even though I was responsible for what happened at the women's campus, I never went to the women's campus never got within those walls. And I had, for example, a educator, a woman educator from Canada who served under me in charge of that particular campus. Could I check on her work? Not really, I had to take her word for everything as to what was going on there. Upon graduation, there were a number of women who, got their, who earned their bachelor's degrees just like there were men. And we attended a graduation that was in this great auditorium that had a great, uh, behind us, that had a great uh, uh, balcony. And all the men that earned their degrees and faculty, teachers and everything, all these others, were all in uh, the main part of the, of the uh, auditorium. And there was a stage up front. And all the women that were graduating were up in the balcony where they could be kept away from all of the men. And what I found fascinating was a couple of things. What marked progress? What marked progress? The fact that women were allowed to, to earn the education and, and earn the degree. What marked progress? That they were allowed to be there. Now, from um, looking through an American standard, an American lens, if you will, and focusing on it through Western eyes, what was the problem? The non-integration was, was part of a problem that, that I would wonder about and I would question. And what I would also question was, although every male student was allowed to walk across the stage to receive their degree, all the female students were required to stay up there. And when their names were called, their fathers walked across the stage and accepted their degrees. Progress, but through Western eyes, perhaps not enough, I don't know. And should we evaluate them based on Western eyes? The answer is probably not. But we can't help it sometimes, can we? And so we watch these things and then at the end of all of this, because a lot of them, it was described to me at the time that they were allowed to get their education at the pleasure, at the decision of their fathers. And if their father said no, they couldn't get the education at all because it was the male who was responsible for protecting the females of the family. But then at the end of that 2009, and I don't know what the status is right now, but the current prince of the region, the royalty, where royalty was there to, to give the, uh, the diplomas. The prince of the region made a statement that said he looked forward to the day when the women could cross the stage and collect their own diplomas. I was happy because what marked progress also suggested they were, they were also eyeing future progress, or at least when I call it progress, am I also calling it westernization? I am, aren't I? So am I actually revealing biases on my part? I am. Should that necessarily be the case? I don't know. 
but we certainly should keep an open mind to recognizing our own bias. We want to introduce in this particular discussion the concepts of individualism and collectivism, don't we? Because a lot of what we talk about with respect to the family, we are talking about individualism and collectivism. In a later discussion, we're going to talk about individualism and collectivism even further. But what is it? Individualism and collectivism. It's a dimension or a continuum along which culture is placed. Individualistic cultures, the American culture being the prime example, value the individual over the group, self-motivation, autonomy, and independent thinking. Collectivists, on the other hand, often the prime example that, that is used is the Japanese culture. Collectivists share intense feelings of dependence on the family, on the culture, on the overall group. Loyalty, collective interests of the group, are often placed before personal harmony. Harmony sought, disapproval avoided. So they try to stay in line, stay in, in sync with what the overall generalized other in the culture is looking for. So when we look at individualism with respect to the family, because of course both individualism and collectivism get socialized into the individual itself, him, himself or herself, within the social institution of the family as distinct values. In the United States, individualism is seen as a hallmark of families. There's an emphasis on independence and individual autonomy. The mother and the child are distinct individuals and not seen necessarily as a unit. So the child is, distinct, is able to distinguish himself or herself. How might this be? They might get their own bedroom, for instance, or their own space. They might be able to create their own space, decorate it with their own interests. They're allowed to pursue various interests that might be different from the rest of the family. Music, for example, if the rest of the family may not be musical. A particular hobby or interest, uh, painting or art or, or sport. The child is encouraged to leave the nest. Right? So at a certain age, they're encouraged to go out and strike out on their own. And the child is often encouraged, and you know the phrase, think for themselves. What do you think? What do you specifically think about what you see? And the encouragement of independent thinking is all part of how we instill individualistic values to children through the family. How, we, how do we communicate those? Collectivism, on the other hand, family interdependence is stressed. Reliance on each other as a team, as a group. Extended families are often emphasized over nuclear families. And extended families rely on each other for the care of children. Friendship, most of your friendships come within those extended families. And any kind of support, both emotional, I, whether it's emotional, financial, physical, etc. The family is always considered paramount and ahead of the individual. Examples of this include the Arab cultures, Latino cultures, Asian cultures, Indian cultures, within the United States, the American Indian cultures. And when we look, for example, at, look, at, at the whole idea of extended families versus nuclear families and gender roles, how do we look at those who are aged? Again, the ideas of how we look at those who are growing older change from culture to culture. The elderly. Well, if in the United States the dominant culture is very individualistic, we have a tendency to show that we prefer youth to old age. 
which winds up resulting in an age bias, and we often look down at the elderly in ways we shouldn't, perhaps. And it even shows in our language, doesn't it? The mere fact that we have mocking terms for the elderly is very suggestive. Codger, fuddy-duddy, geezer, fossil, coot, right? An old coot. Depending upon what part of the country you're in, a lot of these terms are, are there. A lot of, uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, it was quite common for those who went white or gray at a varying age and who were female had a tendency to go ahead and dye their hair blue. And as such, we've also got that term, the blue hair crowd. These are not terms of endearment. These are not affectionate terms. And in fact, the mere fact that all these terms exist within our language suggests that we do not have the highest respect in an individualistic culture for the elderly. And in fact, we have the very concept of retirement homes, nursing homes. That's interesting because what are we, what are we doing? We're trying to shut the elderly away. Get them out of the mainstream. Now, that's the dominant culture in the United States. In the Native American culture, for instance, elders are safekeepers. They're carriers of, of wisdom, of tribal, and, uh, tribal traditions and history and respect. In the African American communities, grandmothers are the most central role in the family. Who carries the most wisdom and knowledge in the African-American community is considered grandmothers. In Asia, devotion and obligation to the past is always considered, and as such, elders and ancestors are almost to the point of being worshipped. In the Latino communities, elderly, the elderly are respected and cared for by the extended families, and in Arab communities, young people are encouraged to listen to and learn from elders as the great teachers of the culture. In fact, in the Muslim world, there is no concept of a nursing home. There is no idea of, let's shut the elderly away in some institution. They are considered always and forever part of the immediate family. So recall when we talked about communication being the social context and the social construction as well as the context for learning various skills, the family being the first source of socialization and learning social skills, what social skills are we specifically talking about? How about starting and stopping a conversation? How do you do it and when is it appropriate? Depending upon what culture you're in, that can change. How about turn-taking? Do I know, for instance, in this culture or that culture, that when I look at you, I'm asking a question, but when I look away, I'm expecting that I can look back, and when I ask you a question, I look away, giving you the opportunity to take the floor. Does that happen that way in every culture? No. When do we do turn-taking in conversation, and how? When not to interrupt. When is it okay to interrupt in a conversation? When do I use silence and how do I use silence? What are the appropriate topics for conversation? Is it okay to use humor? What kind? With whom? And how about the use of nonverbal communication? Again, for example, eye movement and eye pattern during a conversation. Things that we unconsciously know, but maybe we haven't paid conscious attention to. And that become important for us. How about aggression? 
Is, it, is aggression encouraged in some cultures? Sure it is. Standing up for one's rights is an important thing for us to do in certain cultures. How about the stress of harmony, where we avoid aggression? How about decision making? How do we make choices? In what format and what process do we go through? How do we come to decisions and conclusions? You know, an interesting thing to note, and I, I think it's noted very pointedly in this discussion, in person-oriented families, especially individualistic cultures, the more verbally expressive child or spouse or grandparent may play a larger role in the decision making because they're verbally expressive and their information and their opinions and their talk is on the table. It's out there. And if you are an extrovert, you're sometimes favored in that particular society because introverts don't always get that expression out. And as such, when people start taking a more democratic approach to decision making, we take the voices that are heard. That's interesting to know because it really has a tendency to privilege the people who are vocal and willing to express. So as we look at this discussion, the overall emphasis needs to, that we're looking to do here is to demonstrate the prominence of the family as a social institution on communicating the enculturation process. How does culture transmit it? Well, the primary way it's that, that, that that is done is through the family. None of this happens without communication. And as such, communication matters.